Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, what a wonderful week. Uh, we had the peaceful transition to a new administration. And uh, there's some very positive news on the horizon. Um, first of all, let's talk a little bit about, uh, we'll start off with some of the bad data. The USA is obviously in the midst of its surge, over 24 million infected. Now we peaked uh, over 400,000 deaths. California is now the number one state. California leading other states, uh, leading Texas in both cases and uh, mortality now. You know, when you think back on what's happened um, early in, we, we talked about a Thanksgiving surge, but it really wasn't a Thanksgiving surge. Things started to pick up in late September and just kept rising through October and November. As I said back then, most likely due to these wonderful super spreading events called universities and colleges going back to school in the fall. But it seemed to be plateauing until we hit Christmas. And then the Christmas and New Year's was a surge upon a surge. And so we've really been running very high numbers. But we were hoping and expecting that this would begin to uh, begin to fall at some point. And it looks like it is beginning to plateau. So in the US, cases are uh, beginning to plateau now. You can see the curve beginning to flatten. Uh, in Texas, the same thing. Once again, uh, the Houston community is doing better than most of the other big cities. We have been staying a little bit better than most. And to get right down to the Texas Medical Center and our uh, immediate uh, surrounding counties, we're actually doing pretty well. Now, we're not anywhere near where we want to be, but we are doing better. So our case number has now fallen below 3,000 on a regular basis. I mean, it had gotten up over 4,000, which was terrible. Uh, it was that's down uh, close to 2,000. Our, our number, that really important reproduction number, we always want it to be less than one, so the virus is losing and we're winning. It's finally dropped below one for the first time in weeks, so that's all good news. And if you look at our uh, positivity rate, test positivity rate has fallen from a high at about 14.5% down to getting closer to 12%. And I think the best evidence is if you look at the seven day rolling average for hospitalizations, we clearly have hit a plateau. Now, bold predictions. I'm always big on bold predictions. Uh, let's see, Baltimore will lose. That's a bold prediction. I think they already lost. Uh, so we've been doing this great study, Anthony Moreso from our uh, microbiome group has been working with the city and has also and rice investigators and they have been looking at 38 uh, Houston waste treatment centers and you can through the microbiome program virus is excreted in feces and urine you can actually measure the total cumulative virus in a community and it has been rising and rising and rising until just now and it has dropped in 28 out of 30 uh, 28 out of 38 test sites, and it's actually a big drop. It's been a log drop in viral burden. So what that, has, what that means, and based on the way up, what that means is in seven to 10 days, I think we're gonna see a pretty dramat dramatic drop in the number of new cases. Now remember, hospitalizations lag by a week or two, so they're gonna to continue to go up for a little bit, and mortality rate lags behind that. But new cases, should begin to drop based on that study. I will predict that next week when we start talking about this or in two weeks, we'll be in a lot better uh, position. So that's all really very good news. And it's a testament to the Houston community that we are finally following our public health guidance a little bit better uh, than we had been before. So all that I view that as all very positive news in the midst of a mess of a pandemic. Now, one other thing I want to address, you know, we, uh, we it became a, a vaccine hub and uh, initially the Pfizer vaccine was given to healthcare workers for a lot of reasons. Uh, the super cold storage was a real stretch for anyone who didn't have all the hospital facilities. That's kind of the vaccine that has been used mostly for frontline workers. The Moderna vaccine, which followed its approval by about a week later, is the one we've been using for one they finish off 1A and then 1B, many of our patients. I have had so many questions as to should I really get the Moderna vaccine? I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> there are people dying. I mean, this disease is horrible. 
I've, I've got friends who still are on oxygen. And, you know, it's like, well, I heard somebody got a rash. It's like, what is, I mean, people <laughs> want to grab you and shake you. What are you thinking? Uh, but let me, let me not do that. Let me not be emotional about it. Let me just uh, review the data from the Moderna trial because our scientist, uh, Dr. El Sali, was the principal investigator for the Moderna trial that was published in the New England Journal. They had 30,000, not two people, 30,000 people were in the trial, 15,000 in each group. The trial ended when they hit 185 uh, symptomatic patients. And in that, of the 180, uh, when they hit 185, uh, all but 11 were in the placebo group. So everybody, almost all of them, 95% were in the placebo group. And the other thing was there were 30 patients who had severe disease. That's sad, we haven't talked about that much, but 30 people got severely ill and there was one fat fatality, all in the placebo group. So I don't know, should I get the vaccine? Or risk being in the ICU and dying? Like, I don't know, that's a tough question for everybody, but I mean, really, I think you just gotta take the vaccine and stop whining. But last week we talked a lot about the uh, importance of viral surveillance. We were doing a lot of sequencing and why it's important. The United States is about lag behind other countries for viral sequencing and I made the case. We should be doing a lot more of it for three reasons. Uh, we look for variations in the virus or as the British call it, variants of concern. Uh, and we look for clades, different related groups of viruses that move around the world and we can use it for forensics and understanding outbreaks. Well, let's start off with the update on variants of concern. Well, last week we had two, the one in the United Kingdom that's really running rampant throughout South uh, uh, England and London in particular and Kent. And then we also had the one in South Africa. Well, there's a new one, Brazil. So there are now three variants of concern, multiple uh, uh, mutations in the spike protein none of which seem to be important, at least to evade uh, the vaccine response. So that's good news, but there are, are emerging variants, of course. But let's talk about the clade movement. I didn't talk about this at all, uh, and it's really kind of interesting. So if you think back, the very first case of a virus moving around because it was on uh, an airplane was back in January 23rd of 2020, went in the original flight from Wuhan to Vietnam. A bunch of Vietnamese expats living in China flew from Wuhan to Vietnam and then started the whole infection there. So there was another case uh, it recently published, just recently on a 10 hour flight from London to Hanoi, where there were 200 passengers in total, 201, and 16 of those cases were infected by one person. Now that one person was a businesswoman in the world of fashion. Uh, she was based in London, but she traveled to Milan, she traveled to Paris for all these shows, ended up back in London, and then got on the plane to head off to Hanoi. She was, of course, seated in business class. <laughs> poor, poor everybody else who paid money in business class. And four days later after the thing, she developed sore throat and fever uh, when she returned to Vietnam. Now, there were a bunch, a bunch of cases, uh, 16 infected on that one airplane. But think about this, uh, they, they did a really good job of tracing the cases. By the time they traced them, 33 passengers had moved to other countries and, uh, fifth, and many of the passengers and the crew had moved to 15 provinces in Vietnam. So one person infects 16, infects countries and all, all parts of Vietnam. And the only way you can actually figure out all of the movement and what's happening is through understanding which of the clades, which of the one related viruses came from where. And that's why uh, that's really, really important. And so uh, there was no sequencing data for that one. So we couldn't really tell. Well, there was another publication recently that looked at a commercial flight from Boston to Hong Kong uh, from March 8th to March 10th. And in that case, four, uh, four people were infected. There was actually a couple and then they infected two of the, uh, the crew members. Uh, the index case was a married couple. They, of course, they must have been weird because they sat in business class, but one was on a window seat and one sat behind the, the other one, also on a window seat. I guess they didn't want to sit next to each other. Uh, typical of married couples. Uh, so they had recently vi visited Toronto, then they went to New York, and then they went to Boston. And then they were on their flight uh, to Hong Kong. Well, it was March 8th to March 10th. Uh, and on March 10th, 
both of the, the husband and wife became symptomatic. The husband developed a fever and a cough and the wife developed a sore throat. Two flight attendants became symptomatic eight days later. So that was sort of the, the whole mess of that. So how do you sort that out? Well, in order to sort it out, they sequenced all the viruses and all four were identical in all from clade G, which is just a particular region, uh, mostly in North America, of that particular set of viruses. Well, why, why is that important? Well, <laughs> they arrived in Hong Kong. And, and so the people in Hong Kong were very worried. What, what's going on? So they took 1,100 patients in Hong Kong and sequenced all their viruses. Not a single one was from clade G. And within weeks, 200 cases were clay G. And so they actually knew exactly how this couple from North America flew to Hong Kong and started a giant outbreak of clay G. And so this is one of the other ways sequencing can help you understand the movement and, and help make policy and help you figure out you know, what things to do and how to track the viral spread. So there was another forensic study. This is one really trying to sort out an outbreak that was just published in the uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Uh, and this was one that was really kind of interesting because it involves New Zealand. And New Zealand has long been one of the countries that has managed, because it's an island and nobody goes there, uh, to be able to control the viral spread be better than uh, most. And it's very interesting, in April uh, 9th of this past year, New Zealand instituted a policy noted, known as MIQ. Uh, it, it sounds like a secret service thing, MIQ. It was called, it's Managed Isolation and Quarantine at the Border. So what happens if you arrive, nobody from New Zealand can get into New Zealand if you're not from New Zealand, so I can't go there. But if you are a New Zealander and you're in another country, you can come back to New Zealand. But if you do, they haul you <laughs> directly to a government-sponsored quarantine site where you spend 14 days in quarantine. And not only that, they sequence or they sample you on days three, seven, and ten, and at the time of release, and they have all these viral sequences. So they really can tell what's going on. So there was this flight uh, that was from uh, heading off to New Zealand from Dubai. Uh, it was heading to Auckland, and it had to stop in Kuala Lumpur uh, to get refueled. It's a long trip. In Malaysia, they stopped for two hours. One of the important things is they stopped the ventilation system I talk about so much that brings in air and sterilizes air, but well, they stopped it for two hours. That wasn't great thinking. Uh, and when everybody arrived, they had the mandatory MIQ. Now, the interesting thing about this is seven passengers were found to be positive, and they originated from five different countries before the layover in Dubai. So how could you ever figure out? I mean, all these different countries, everybody's infected. Well, they sequenced the virus. And it was pretty clear that this one couple were the index case because they developed symptoms first. Uh, and so they did uh, sequencing on all, all the seven positives, and they were genetically identical. So despite the fact they came from all these different countries, they were genetically identical, which almost certainly proved that they got it on the airplane from that particular, uh, that particular couple. Now, one, one of the interesting things is, uh, so... All six of the seven were, all seven were identical, but six of the seven got symptomatic within four days. One poor guy uh, got symptomatic late in the quarantine period, and when they sequenced that person, it was also identical. So he no doubt caught it from somebody in quarantine. So, you know, they may have been quarantining, but they, were, they weren't staying apart. So th that also proved how the transmission was in the airplane, then how they developed symptoms and were sequenced in the quarantine period. And one person who was in the quarantine period got it from somebody who was also being quarantined. So sequencing has been an amazing forensic uh, tool to sort of figure out transmission of these viruses. So, you know, it's really, really important uh, to continue to expand our horizons around sequencing to look for variants and also to understand the travel of, and how this virus works to infect people. So one last thing, uh, really important, as we roll out more and more vaccines to people, I'm getting more and more questions. Well, now that I'm vaccinated, do I need to wear a mask? <laughs> yes, you need to wear a mask for about 100,000 reasons. Well, for one, nobody, nobody knows that you're vaccinated. So, you know, when you're walking into a store or you're walking around and, you know, you're walking without a mask and everybody goes crazy, you don't want to have like, well, I was vaccinated. You know, you don't want to be that person. So 
just for social reasons, I would strongly recommend you wear a mask. Second thing is it's not 100%. The vaccines don't, aren't 100% uh, perfect in preventing you from getting disease. So it's only, even if it's 90, 95%, there's still a 5% chance you can get it. So wear your mask so you don't get it, even if you're that 5%. Uh, a third thing is that, uh, you know, we just, we're not 100% certain that you can't transmit the virus. You may not get in, be sick from it, but it's not clear that you may not, that you won't carry the virus and infect others. There's one preliminary study, and I have not, have not seen the primary data, but they took 20 people in Israel who'd been vaccinated and followed them out, and it looks like they are not transmitting the virus. They can't detect the virus. So it may well be that this vaccine sterilizes the system so that you can't transmit virus. We don't know that 100%, but that's a real positive sign. And so if that turns out to be true, when enough people get vaccinated, you may not have to wear your mask. So uh, all that's really, really good news. And I, I just want to uh, just conclude this week by just thanking everybody in Houston. I mean, Houston is doing so much better than other large cities. And I do think it is because our populace really does care. Our citizens care about each other. Uh, I, I have seen pretty good, I mean, very good uh, compliance with public health measures. So I'm very proud of our city. Uh, I don't know what's going on in Southern California, but I'm never going there again. It is a complete, a complete mess. But I know this is getting tiring for everybody. It's stressful to be isolated. We all want to throw off our masks and get it excited. And it's gotten so bad, uh, even Lily begins to miss her companions. And so finally, we decided to break quarantine and let Lily visit Snoopy. And so you'll see the response in, in this week's video. So have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you.